since I'm first up, since I'm uh, not really a newbie down here. Uh, a lot of you know me as a newbie barbecue. Uh, we do mainly KCBS, started doing some SVN. Uh, did pretty well. We finished 44th in the country last year overall in KCBS out of about 5,600 teams. Uh, a lot of traveling, a lot of heartache, a lot of, uh, a lot of setbacks. So, when it comes with the territory. Uh, what we're going to be covering tonight is, I'm going to probably pretty much be going over to brisket. Uh, the other competition teams will chime in if they've got, you know, a little <coughs> trick of doing something that might make it easier for y'all how to trim the brisket, how to choose one, uh, how to cook it, how they cook it. Not everybody does it the same way. So, they're going to give some insight on how they do theirs too while I'm doing it. So, uh, they're all very tough competitors. Uh, any given any given week, uh, somebody take Grant and you know it goes from there. So you just try to uh, do the best you can. Uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to try to explain how to how to pick a brisket out. We're going to go through it kind of quick. Uh, so if I'm cutting and one of these other guys got something to say, you know, y'all feel free. Uh, the way I usually pick a brisket out, of course you go to the meat shop, you sit there been doing this number to it. You want it to flop. First I like a little bit more flop than this, but on a day notice, there's not a whole lot I could do. So anyway, it, the more it flops, usually the more aged it is, it's going to be a little bit more tender. Uh, brisket comes from this part of the cow. It's the most heavily used muscle and it's the most toughest piece of meat you'll ever try to cook. But if you cook it the way we discuss it here, it'll be one of the best tasting pieces of meat you'll ever eat. So we're gonna go through some insights on what we, uh, what we do as far as flavor profiles, uh, what, what we're looking for, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, normally I look for a whole packer. This one is, uh, let me put my glass on, this one's about 14 and a half pounds. This one's kinda on the bottom range of where I want to be. I like mine about, anywhere from 15 to 18 pounds. Is that about what y'all look for? Yes. Uh, so, uh, you wanna look for something like that. You wanna look, try to look for one with a little bit of marbling in it. Uh, Angus, if you can get it. Uh, most of these guys, uh, in competition, we cook Wagyu beef. Uh, it's American Kobe beef. A little more expensive than these. But when you've got upwards of anywhere from five to $10,000 riding on the competition, 50, 60 bucks, not gonna make that big of a difference. Mm -hmm. So, what I've got here is, right here is the flat. So what I usually look for, I try to look for a decent sized flat, you know, one and a half, two inches minimum on the thickness. You're not gonna find that all the time, but that's what you try to look for. And right up here is the point. So I look for a good, nice little point. I don't want it sticking way out here, because I'm gonna trim it down anyway. Uh, and then you got a nice little fat layer here. It's not totally thick. So you don't want to pay for fat that we're going to trim off anyway. So basically what I'm going to do is on the, on the top of the flat, not the fat side, but the, you see it's got sinew. It's got streams of fat in there. I'm going to go ahead and start peeling some of that off, get down to the meat. Rub has to hit meat for it to penetrate and for it to stick. If you put it on fat, if that's going to taste good, the meat's not going to taste worth the crap. <laughs> so anyway, we try to trim as much of this off as possible. That's where we get our bark from. It allows the, uh, the rubs to penetrate the meat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut some of this big, thick fat off the side. And I'm going to shave. Anybody wants to chime in, knock yourself out. Uh, I'm going to shave a lot of this sinew and stuff off. I'm going to go a little quicker than what I normally do in competition, but I want to get y'all the gist of it. If y'all paid attention to how much fat and gristle was on the top of this, uh, like I said, you, you might still see a little bit of fat, which is not bad, that's the marbling, but you really don't want that sinew on there, because like I said, that, that rub will not penetrate that. Is that true on pork, too? Yes. It, uh, now pork, you know, it's got a little bit different kind of fat to it. Um, usually when we try to get our bark, we try to get down to the meat, but we're not going to take all the fat off the pork. Uh, we do leave a little bit on there. Uh, 
just so we have something to render. Now Brad is an excellent pork guy, and uh, you trim a lot of your fat off the pork butts, or? No. Not, um, <clears throat> not a whole lot. We'll, we'll show you all that in a minute. But basically what I'm doing is I'm just trying to get this, uh, this side's not as important, but I do like to trim on the fat side. I like to try to get it down, you know, try to get it to a quarter of an inch thick. You don't really need any more fat on it than that, because then when you put it in your au jus, as you'll see when I bring it out, you don't want all that grease in your au jus. So it's going to render down a good bit. So all I'm doing right now, I'm just kind of shaping the fat on the, on the fat side. And uh, if you feel the fat and it's firm, it's too thick. So just, just keep shaving it until you get it down to where you want it to be. Yes, ma'am. I'm guessing that's from a warehouse store, <clears throat> one or two in town. Actually, I got this from Kroger. Okay. Kroger's carrying them. Uh, Franklin's. Good looking briskets in there, too. Huh? Good looking briskets in there. These are, uh, this is actually an IBP brand. Uh, Franklin gets some good uh, Angus briskets right there. <laughs> but, but I'm going to tell you, as far as competition, IBP with the butts and the ribs and all that, they're real heavy. That they're a lot better than, let's say, like a Smithfield brand, XL brand. Uh, they're, to me, they're a little bit better quality. So All right. when, you get, when you get your Wagyu, where do you get that from? You have to order it. There's several companies online. The Snake River Farms. Um, Screw Branch. Brasstown Valley. Um, there's a lot of different companies that, that specialize in that, in that meat. And you right. order it from them. They ship it to you, usually frozen with a, in a cooler with a bunch of ice packs and whatnot. And, Last one I got was $160, so you know the brisket's 60, 70 bucks, and it's $60 ship. So yeah, they get you on the shipping. Yeah. You get a nice little styrofoam cooler <laughs> that breaks after you, or if it's not already broken by the time you get it, but you do get the kick gel packs. How many of those coolers you got? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Too many. All right, this is I've got to put a quick trim on this. And you see a lot of the fat's gone on this side. You got solid meat right here. And then on this side, it's still got fat here, but it's kind of thinned out. So, you see how it flops a little bit better now? That's, it's going to cook up pretty good. So, it's pretty tender. Now, before I inject or anything, and I'm still in my right mind, you know, it's not 3 o'clock in the morning, is a little trick that I try to tell people to do is, you want to cut this thing across the grain when you cut it. So the easiest and the surest way of doing that is you can really see the grain which way it's going. It's going toward this point right here. So what I do is I'll take about two inches off that corner, 90 degrees to that grain, and that's where all of my slices are going to come at that angle right there. That way when it cooks up, you can't see the grain. If you've got heavy bark, you know that's the angle that you started off on. That's what you're going to cut it at. So there's no guessing that, you know, 20 minutes before turn in which way you're going to cut it. So Now is there a difference between a left-handed and a right-handed brisket? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a myth going around the competition. Yes. It's better to have a left-handed one or is it, uh, they say... It depends on if the cows are left or right-handed. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't noticed the difference. I really haven't. Uh, you mean the guy cutting you left-handed and right-handed? No, no, the, the brisket will be... You got a left and a right on the chest. On the, on the chest there. So some people think the left, left side is more tender than the right side. Yeah. But you think about it, they're using the same muscles as, you know, I think it's uh, a lot of these barbecue people like mojo on them. But I do know if you cook two briskets, you don't want a left and right because sometimes it could come from the same cow. So you want two lefts or two rights. That way you know it didn't come from the same animal. Well, it depends on whether the cows are right or left handed. Exactly, that's what I was saying. I was asked the cow. Yeah, look at what, which way he throws the ball, you know? <laughs> so anyway, we've got it down to here. So you're ready to, uh, what we usually do is 98% uh, of teams will inject this. Now it varies from one team to another. Uh, things people inject, you can buy injections off online. You can do, some people do a beef base that's been strained. Some people do a beef au jus. Some people do apple juice, whatever. Uh, it's just whatever flavor y'all want. I try to stay away from the little saltier things because my rub is going to have a lot of salt in it. So, in a big piece of meat like this can handle it. Uh, it's also got a lot of chili powder in it. So, uh, 
But getting back to injection, if you look at the grain of this piece of meat, you want to go with the grain. Now some people come up from the bottom injected, I come from the top and inject it down there. I never inject on the sides, because personally if it, if it starts coming out, it's going to come out of here and the injection is going to run out quicker than it will if it comes out the top. So I try to stay at the top, you want to go in an angle because it's not a real thick piece of meat. And you just go right in with the grain of the meat. Let it sit there anywhere from two to eight hours, and then you'll put your rub on it. Now, I usually don't wipe my injection off. I usually rub it on there and use that as a binder. Uh, some people use olive oil, peanut oil, uh, whatever to use as a binder. I don't have anybody using mustard on this. So. Um, <coughs> but anyways, once you, get, once you get your binder on there, you want to go with a rub. Now, I use about two or three different flavor profi profiles on this. I'll do a, a hotter one on the bottom. I'll even add some uh, cracked pepper to this. And then I'll do a sweeter one on top, and then I'll come back in with a hotter one on the top. I just like a good flavor profile all the way up. Uh, the, the saltier the rub, the more to penetrate this meat. Uh, but you want it to open the pores up when the smoke hits it. That's where you get your smoke ring from. So the longer it's exposed to smoke, normally it's a chemical reaction, uh, you usually get a better smoke ring. But you got a couple guys here that cook hot and fast, they'll get just as good a smoke ring. Uh, it all depends on your cooker, how you're used to cooking. Uh, I usually cook these at 275, they'll cook anywhere from four to five hours, unwrapped. And then when I, when I put them in the, uh, I've got these that are in pans I'm fixing to show you. You can wrap them with aluminum foil, there you can put beef broth, au jus, uh, beef paste in there, whatever, apple juice, whatever floats your boat. Um, it's just whatever flavor profile y'all looking for. I've seen people use a lot of off stuff, off the wall stuff, so. Uh, I know what works for me, and they know what works for them. So, did I cover everything on? Yes, sir. So, um, How long do you age? Do you ever age your uh, If I know the packing date, I'll go between 30 and 40 days after packing date, but my cooler's got to stay between 32 and 34 degrees. <coughs> and if I don't ever take it out of the package, and what I look for is I look for little bubbles on the package, and that tells me the gases are starting to release. That tells me it's time to freeze it. And it still gives you a day or two to thaw it out and still be very safe on it. Some teams will go 45 days on theirs. They're a little bit more scientific than what I am. But I do like to see some little bubbles in the, in the wrap before I freeze them. Uh, any other questions? Um, what I'm trying to get to is uh, you want to get around 195 internal. Uh, before I wrap this, it can be 150 to 170. What I'm looking for, I'm looking for a bark. A lot of these competition cooks, before they wrap them, they want to get to a certain temperature, yeah, but they also want to get that bark or that color or whatever that's going to really make it pop to the judges. So anywhere between 150 and 170 is where I wrap it. Um, like I said, I'm looking for the bark. And I don't know if it depends on humidity or what, but sometimes the bark sets a lot quicker on some days than others. Um, and then you want to cook it to 195. And what I would suggest to do is, uh, I don't know if I have a thermopin up here. We, we live and die by the thermopin. Um, you want to stick it in there. And if you feel any resistance, Stick it back in there for another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, you want that, any kind of thermometer that you use, you want it to slide in, slide out real easy. Once it does that, it could go all the way up to 205. It doesn't matter what kind of brisket it is. I've taken a Wagyu up to 207 to get that feel. Uh, if it gets to 212, you got pot roast, just that gravy mashed potatoes, you're good to go. <laughs> uh, so there's a fine line in there. Uh, but what you want, you, you're looking for that because when you slice it, you want, you want the tenderness of it. Uh, you got to get to that certain point though. And then if it gets to that, then what you want to do is you want to unwrap it, let it quit cooking, and then you want to wrap it back up in loom foil, say eight to 10 minutes later, and stick it in somewhere that will stay warm, like a cooler, wrap it up in a heavy wool blanket. But we usually let ours rest. I let mine rest three, three four hours before turning. Three, so and with that all you and all that in there, it'll start soaking it back up. Then actually your bark will set a little bit too. Uh, when it's sitting there cooling off. Uh, any questions so far? Yes, sir. Uh, you said 275 by 45 hours, that's when you wrap. 
Yeah, but you want to look at the color. Yeah, you want to look at the color of it. If you've got a real dark, some people go for a dark mahogany. I go between dark mahogany and almost black. And then, like I said, when you wrap it up, it'll loosen back up. I mean, because it'll steam in there a little bit. So it's up to you. Usually, at, it won't take any more smoke after 150. You won't get any more smoke. So I usually, I'll, I usually wrap mine between 150 and 160. Yeah. But there again, it's like Jim said, you want to look at that bark color too. About how long is the 195? About half as long as what it took you to get to it. About half as long as what it took you to get there. Jim, have you ever what used the, the, the bark? The bark calls the juice inside more. Does it what now? Well, the bark, when you put your bark on the outside before you wrap it, will the whole moisture inside? It will, but when you wrap it, that all just kind of turns almost like mush. Yeah. And then when you bring it out the rest, it'll tighten back, that bark will get hard hard again. It'll tighten back up. It's kind of sealing your water. Yeah, it'll seal it in. It also helps soak some more in. Have you ever used a plastic cooking bag? No. Number one, it's illegal in KCBS, but number two, no, I haven't. Uh, aluminum foil, we take stock in aluminum foil. <laughs> aluminum foil pans, aluminum foil, we go through it, trust me. Uh, but usually about 160 is when you want to wrap it. You, you want it to get in the moisture uh, for as long as possible, that's going to make it more tender. It's going to make it more juicier brisket. You don't have to inject these. These that I did tonight, I did not inject. So we'll see how they turn out. Very, very few I don't inject. Um, Question, Jim. Yes. How much is doing well in the competition for the meat and how much is the technique for the person who's doing it? I think it always is about the same. I think you really, in order to, there are so many teams out there that are so good. I mean, it is very tight margins. I mean, you, you could lose one spot by .0002. I've done it several times this year. So you want the best possible meat you can find without breaking the bank, so to speak. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and you know, some people's one on just regular CAB brisket, certified Angus beef. And some people, you know, a lot of us feel better with the Wagyu we think gives us an upper hand. So, uh, but a lot of teams are doing it, probably 70, 80% of teams are using Wagyu. Uh, Cause they don't want to give up $50 to the chance to earn, like I said, five or $10,000. So, Jim, what's the definition of Angus? The te technical definition of Angus. When you you see that advertising, you think that's the best. Well, that Kobe stuff, I guess, out of Japan, something I guess is something different. Yeah, Kobe beef is. I think it's got to be within two generations of the original Kobe beef that comes from Japan. That the cows and the generations have to be within two generations. called Wagyu beef. Uh, they call it American Kobe or Wagyu because you know it's it's not true Kobe beef. Uh, <coughs> Within 30 miles of this store here at Super Plantation, they raised American Wagyu. Right. It's, a, it's a cross between the Black Angus and the Wagyu. It's a rich breed as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out one that I've cooked. What I did is uh, instead of wrapping the aluminum foil, I put it in a pan. And I put a rack in the bottom of the pan. I'm going to need my gloves because this is going to be hot. It might be. Uh, well, I've not opened this in about two hours, so we'll see. Now, I had to cook this at uh, about 300, 310 degrees, faster than what I'm used to cooking. So these guys are coming at us a little too slow. This brisket cook, total cooking time was five and a half hours. So it's three hours on the smoker, hour and a half wrapped up, and that's what it looks like. So you can see we got the dark bark and everything on it. It's pretty hot. Uh, I got the au in the bottom, so it's not soaking in it, and it helps uh, steam it a little bit. Uh, of course, that makes good uh, au jus there. And of course, you need an overbearing knife to cut it with. <laughs> So what we do is right here, the grain is going this way. So I'm going to cut it this way. I want it 90 degrees away from the grain. And hopefully we'll have a uh, smoke ring on here. See how easy that cuts? Yeah. This went to 205 before I pulled this. Now I'm going to try to get there to look at this. This is a smoke ring right around the edge. So you can... 
So it's true you can get a smoke ring in three hours. Probably actually two hours. Mm -hmm. So, and then the pull test, you want it slightly pull and it comes apart. You want a little bit of a resistance, it comes apart. So right now, this is about dead on as far as the temperature what we're looking for. The grill temp? I cook these at 300 to 310. I normally cook at 275. That's my grate temp. So if you got something set on the grate, on the green eggs, it'll be 300 degrees on the temperature gauge, but your grate will be 275. Now I cook these on a new smoker I just got. It's a Southern Q smoker. It's uh, kind of a box style smoker. It's a uh, gravity fed charcoal. Uh, very good smoker, holds temperature to a T. You do use a guru on it. Best way to keep the optimum temperature, you can use that on the uh, green egg too. Uh, it's very important to keep a real steady temperature on these. You don't want it spiking up and down, up and down. It's gonna mess with your cook times, it's gonna mess with the meat. So the more even you can cook your meat, the better off you're gonna be. Um, so basically in competition, what we're gonna do is we're gonna slice them about pencil width thick. Uh, and what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to take the uh, flat off the point because as all these uh, barbecuers know this is where the burn ends come from if everybody's heard of burn ends this comes from the point right here it usually has the most marbling in the whole brisket and when it's got a lot of marbling on it it's going to be very very tender and so what we do is we'll normally we'll trim it up a little bit more but you can see even right here, you can still see some fat striations in there. That's going to tell me right there, it's got a smoke ring around it. That's going to tell me it's going to be a real juicy piece of meat. So, normally we'll pan these and put them back on the smoker and cook them a little bit longer separate from the flat. Uh, I didn't have that luxury of time. Uh, so, what I'm going to do, we want to do a box real quick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick box of what it's going to look like similar to what we turn in. Uh, there's only so much you can arrange your brisket. Uh, so what we usually do is we'll cut the burn ends off. Is that burn ends kind of like an end cut on a prime rib, kind of? Uh, it's the point, so not really. It's, it's just the, uh, comes up here towards the shoulder. So it's not worked as much as the chest muscles when it's breathing in and out. All that just works that muscle makes it a real tight muscle. So you can cook these things a little lower and slower, longer. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of y'all are used to it. Uh, don't let the brisket intimidate you. All this brisket is is internal temperature. Uh, it's the right kind of seasonings on it. Uh, I usually use smoking guns hot. Uh, I've got some smoking gun sweet heat. Uh, that's a good one to use on it. And, the, and I'm going to tell you, these guys also back me up. We get our competition meat from right on top of this point. We use the flat, but we're going to get it from right here by this point. Pretty good. <laughs> Not bad for an amateur. <laughs> Smells good. I'm an auto. Explain the smoke ring again. This is it right here. See that ring right below the bark? Pink ring. That pink oh, okay. ring? Yes. That's the smoke ring. Okay. That has to do with the chemical reaction between the smoke and the meat. Okay. The longer you are exposed to smoke under 150, supposedly the better smoke ring you'll have. But also it depends on the meat itself. If it's a tender piece of meat, you're going to get a deeper smoke ring. Mm -hmm. It'll penetrate a lot easier. And also, if, uh, if the meat's real cold before you put it on the smoker, it tends to give you a little thicker smoke ring as well. I found that. Is that good? Well, I mean, for looks. I mean, the judge looks at the box. Yeah. They like to smoke ring. We lay those brisket slices in here to where they can we kind of accent the smoke ring of it. It, 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 it helps in appearance. We're not, supposed to, we're not supposed to judge on, on the smoke ring because the smoke ring can be artificially produced. Yeah, quick, what is it? Quick salt? Quick? Tender quick. Tender, tender quick. quick. Tender quick on it. Everybody knows that trick. Yeah. Everybody uses that trick. Yep. <laughs> That's a guaranteed 100% smoke ring. I'm going to tell you that from experience. 
Yeah. And not have no wood at all involved. That is a guaranteed 100% smoke ring you don't have to worry about. <coughs> yeah. Cut some of this fat off here. So basically what I'm doing, I'm just trimming it up. I think Brad's going to help uh, do the plating on this. I have to give some of my uh, skill on trimming some of this. Now, now Waylon said something a minute ago I want to talk about for a second. Because in competition it might be, you guys might be comfortable starting with uh, a meat that has not been tempered. Mm -hmm. But I personally would never do a, st a cut like a brisket. Boston butt probably, but a brisket, I would never do it where I started with it quote unquote cold, trying to manipulate the smoke ring. I could care less about the smoke ring in my backyard. I just want it to be really good and tender. And tempering will, the risk you run there is if you don't properly temper that cut, especially something thick, like any kind of a, a roast, you're going to run the risk of having a, a, a very large difference between the, the doneness temperature in the center versus the outside. So I, I, unless you're really comfortable doing a brisket, uh, I would not do it, um, start with it cold, and I would, pr frankly, I would never do it in five hours. Um, I can't imagine doing a, bit, a brisket in five hours, personally. Uh, I just can't, I can't see it. That's about an eight to ten hour cook, for, about an eight hour cook yeah. for me, personally. Well, We're going to train each other. What was that question? Well, a piece of meat that size, about how long was it going to take? Well, it depends. If, if you bought it refrigerated and, and obviously it didn't have any, any ice or no, fro uh, it wasn't frozen at all, a couple of hours probably um, at the most. Anybody have an opinion on that? How long would you temper a, a brisket about this, this size to get it to a, up to a somewhat uh, consistent internal temp? <coughs> Two hours? I, I rub my Three or four hours, so. But I got to go the whole time. Okay. So basically, uh, Brad's got the box. He's going to show you tentatively how they look. Wow. We, we try to accent the smoke ring on there. We try to accent the burn ends. Now, most of us, a lot of times, we don't park burn ins in there because if it does not really wow us, it'll take away from the store and we don't want to do that. <laughs> so if the brisket's really good and the burn ins are okay, we don't put them in the box. Mm -hmm. put, the judges pass the box around the table <coughs> and they judge it on appearance first. You, know, you, eat, you eat with your eyes anyway, so one of my real pleasing <laughs> It's very important to get the appearance down to a T because that sets, that sets your score up pretty much for the rest of the thing. And also, if you can get the meat, doesn't matter what you've got, to the judges as quick as possible, as hot as possible. They're not supposed to judge on heat, but as everybody knows, hot or warm, hot or barbecue tastes better. So, uh, any questions on the brisket? No questions? Well, I must be good. <laughs>